about Alice Shilley, and I know most of you know Alice very well. Um, there is currently a show right now at Capital University at the Schumacher Gallery, and I have the little catalog for that. And it's actually on modernist women, and it includes Alice Shilley. It also includes a number of, of other artists who are in our collection. Edna Boyce Hopkins, who is another Columbus artist um, that you all might be familiar with. And there's been um, quite a bit of new research that um, this show is based on, and actually new, uh, our, a new ability, a new access to archives and some material. And so we'll talk about that a little bit. But I thought, first of all, we'd just give a little bit of an introduction about Alice. Um, so I'll let Jim talk a few minutes about this, and then we'll sort of branch out into what we want to, some new stuff. Okay, well, um, I guess the basics on Alice was that um, she was one of six children of um, Peter and Sophia Shilley. Was born in 1886 in Columbus, um, down in the downtown areas where she grew up on Friend Street, which is now Main Street. And then eventually their family, as they became more and more affluent, moved to what they called the sort of the Gold Coast in those days, Bryden Road, to a beautiful home there. Um, she studied in Columbus at the Columbus Art School, uh, went on to study at the Art Students League in New York and then um, was awarded a scholarship by William Merritt Chase to study at the Chase School of Art in Shinnecock. So she had substantial training in the United States, but that wasn't enough. She goes on to Paris and studies at the Academy Colorossi, where many American uh, artists studied, and a number of the women that were dressing in this show at CAP, 10 Midwestern Modern women, um, were there at the same time. Uh, so that's based, the basic background on Alice. But beyond that, uh, once she begins to enter her career to get really active, starting at the New York Watercolor Club in 1900, and then continuing on with various other venues, uh, she becomes very well known as a watercolorist, really one of the top watercolorists in the country, and wins major prizes in uh, large expositions in San Francisco, Philadelphia, Chicago, for her work. And now we're going to look at some of those works and get through a little bit of an evolution of her style. So we thought we would, um, I, I sort of asked Jim if he would talk about her work in a bigger art history context. Um, and some of you might know this, but it sort of sets the stage for this, this um, sort of a new way of, of placing her work. Um, so first of all, we, we thought we would talk, I asked Jim to talk just a little bit about some early uh, pieces. Yeah, the, uh, the work to the left called Four Children, Brittany, uh, is a classic example of the genre scenes that Shelley became very famous for, that she built her career upon, really, that she did between 1903 and 1908. It was exhibited at the New York Watercolor Club, uh, reviewed very favorably in the New York Times and illustrated in 1908 there. Um, and it really, it captures in a lot of ways the essence of Shelley, where you've got this amazing sense of draftsmanship. She could really draw, capture the uh, wonderful features of these children, beautifully drawn faces, wonderful treatment of the hands, um, but also her sense of color and design, exquisitely modulated color and a nice um, strong um, diagonal composition, which is quite modern in, in terms of the way of the treatment. Um, the picture planes picked up, uh, figures are cropped, so it has a relationship to not only Joseph Israels, who's doing these more traditional scenes in Holland, just as Shelley did them in Brittany and Holland, but more importantly to Paul Gauguin, who uh, is very much the post-impressionist avant-garde painter, and it's fascinating to compare their design elements there. Um, so here, basically, the first chapter in Alice Shelley, the genre scenes. And I, I like Jim's idea of comparing, I'll just add my own thing, comparing to Gauguin, because we may not think of that when we look at a work here, but in fact, this angle, and when you start to think about this, the blue and these sort of simple flat colors, she really is looking at someone like Gauguin, but it's, it's absorbed, right? She's just not imitating Gauguin. She's really absorbed it into even, a vision and, of her and own. And continuing that idea, look at the punch of the shilly versus the Joseph Israels. Yeah, these two. Beautifully done, sensitive, but not nearly as powerful and dramatic because of her sense of that modern sense of design. Mm -hmm. um, then the next chapter with Shelley is really, uh, begins around 1909 and continues through the early teens. Um, at that time, 
Whistler had died in 1903, and there was a huge resurgence of interest in Whistler's work um, in England, but particularly in France, where Shelley was spending a lot of time before World War I. And so you can see her looking at, you know, this is a Whistler in the center here, these very reductive, elegant, um, almost monochromatic vignettes of urban life, and uh, see her sort of interpreting them in the work to the left, Trafalgar Square, which is a classic uh, link with Whistler, Hassam, and then with Saint-Germain-des-Prés up there in 1911, where you've got a fairly reductive design, strong verticals, horizontals, limited palette, crop forms, those kinds of things that you think of when you think of, of Whistler. Um, the one in the, the picture in the center, Saint-Germain-des-Prés, was painted in France, in Paris, and um, Shelley won two of her major prizes based on that particular watercolor. So there was a lot of interest nationally and internationally in that style. But what I think is intriguing too to look at is that while there's a relationship to Whistler, Shelley can never get away from the figure. I mean, she understands the figure, she understands human emotion, vignettes, you know, how the telling gesture. So there's always a bit of that storytelling aspect that's part of Shelley that really isn't part of Whistler. Whistler's much more reductive, more spare, less interested in the humanity aspects, at least in these types of pictures. Uh, the one to the right is interesting in that um, it's a series of works that relate to Whistler and um, Chase, flattened picture plane, asymmetrical design, that type of thing. And it anchors her career. Uh, she does this series in Dalmatia in 1909, uh, alongside of Martha Walter, her great friend from the Chase School, who was a famous painter from Philadelphia. And here she really begins to make this wonderful kind of matrix of uh, design and humanity, where she's studying the peasants in the marketplace, fascinated by that, but real strong sense of design. When she comes back from Dalmatia, uh, she's contacted by the Cincinnati Art Museum and they give her her first one-person show in 1911 based on the Dalmatian series. And this next series takes place in Le Puy in South Central France, uh, which I was lucky enough to go visit several times. Absolutely gorgeous um, kind of uh, highland village in a remote area. And she goes there in 1911, 1912, and 1913. And there she really perfects her, um, this wonderful combination, as I said, of design and storytelling. And I think the, uh, the picture to the right is particularly fascinating, the way that the composition spins out around that hub of the tree. The right and you see these diagonals coming out, fascinating frieze in the background. But also, you know, you zoom in on these figures you know, they're talking to each other, it's very animated, you feel like it's a, it's a very much an alive, real uh, situation. The critics absolutely love these. Uh, she has a major story in International Studio Magazine, which was one of the top periodicals of the day, and they feature just these works. And that really helps to kind of anchor her career. Shortly after, she wins the big prize at the uh, Society of Western Artists at the Art Institute of Chicago and um, is getting ex amazing kind of reviews throughout the papers of the country at that time as one of the top watercolorists. But hard to believe, a few years later, <coughs> she comes back from France, and she and a number of the women artists that, were, that are in this, featured in the show at Capitol end up in two key art colonies. One is Gloucester, where Shelley goes, and another is Provincetown. And when these figures get together, all of a sudden it's as if all the modernist aspects that they were seeing in Europe before the war just pop and gel. And so you've got this amazing explosion of color, you know, arbitrary, really rich, vibrant colors, reductive designs, outlining that one associates with uh, the fauves, expressive skies, um, this um, real flowering of modernism. You can see various aspects of pointillism going on on the uh, sea and tidal river to the left, up in the sky, the treatment of the figures, and then here in the treatment of the sky as well and in the treatment of the sand. 
Um, but what's interesting, though, to juxtapose here is the dialogue with Prendergast. Many people compare Shelley with Prendergast for good cause, particularly, I think, when you look at Sea and Tidal River and Saint Malo, they're quite related. But when you look over here at afternoon at the beach, very different. Similar palette, use of pointillism, but much more storytelling, much more interest in the figure, uh, a stronger sense of design, design that's more uh, oriented almost around ellipticals, where you've got these echoing uh, round forms of the umbrellas and the groupings of figures. That's very much um, Alice Schilling. And I, I like this, this particular work as well, The Afternoon at the Beach, because again, it shows her absorbing these different things and not just mimic them, mimicking them. So you have this diagonal, right? You think of um, the interest in sort of Whistler nocturnes and, um, and uh, Japanese art and composition. Um, and, and this supports that, right? And then with this angle here. But when you look at this, what Jim's saying about this narrative and the storytelling and the human interaction, you know, the little boy who's talking here. And so it's a really sophisticated design, but, but in some ways interested in more things. And here we can kind of continue some of these ideas of modernism. Essentially, uh, one of the things that Chile introduces to American modernism is a fascination with pointillism. But oftentimes when we think of pointillism, we think of Seurat as very academic, very tight, um, scientific use of dots. But some of the other uh, artists that were active in Europe, like Durand, Vlaminck, and Matisse, were using expressive variants of pointillism. Schilly really responds to that. And in this wonderful beach scene here, the pier, you can see how she uh, actively uh, manipulates the daubing to give it in an expressive very vibrant effect. Tragically, this picture is no longer with us. It was destroyed in a fire in Nashville. Know, yeah, some fabulous collectors of this amazing collection, and um, it's no longer around, unfortunately. I uh, wanted to just sort of refresh our, our memories and, and have Jim sort of refresh our mind with placing her in this broader art historical context, and we've certainly done that before. But, um, you know, things are online now, <clears throat> and so um, what Jim and his daughter Tara have certainly spent some time doing is going through these archives that are now accessible. And one thing that Jim, and I'll let him talk a little bit about this moment in Paris, but um, I also want you to talk about this issue of museums and what sort of got into sure, museums and yeah. why. So we're going to place her in a context of women's network, which has been kind of ignored but is incredibly important. So. Well, um, as I said a little bit earlier, uh, when Alice Shelley gets to Paris, just uh, around 1903, 1904, there are a number of interesting women artists active there, uh, many of them from the Midwest, and she fits right into that, into that group, uh, falls in love with Paris, continues to go back and forth there for the next 10 years. While she is there, uh, Edna Hopkins, who did this wonderful color woodcut to the upper left, Veronica, um, is there. She also did the work to the right. And there, um, she's, uh, she's there for about 10 years with her husband, James Hopkins, who is known as the, Hop you know, the Hopkins of Hopkins Hall. He later went on to be the head of the art department at Ohio State. But uh, while they're there, there's a lot of interest in, in modernism, what's going on. As I said before, fascinated with Whistler, with Japanism, with Oriental sense of design. So you definitely see that starting here with the work to the left, and then you see it in the Shilly work to the right, done almost exactly the same time, with the sort of staccato treatment of the figures, strong use of diagonals, reductive forms, limited palette, almost a perfumed essence that you think of with Whistler is going on early on in the Paris experience. But by the end of it, this one's done right after Edna leaves Paris because of World War I, everybody has to leave. This flowering of color, flattening of the picture plane, much broader sense of design, much broader, or stronger use of form, that pops in these art colonies. So this is kind of the beginning. And we put the map up there because it's fascinating to see where the various artists were living. Many of them, well, like Mars, Ethel Mars, and Maud Squire, who were two well-known artists from Cincinnati, 
were very good friends of Edna and James Hopkins. They were literally next door neighbors. And then three blocks over is Gertrude Stein's house. They all went over there <laughs> and on and on. So, I mean, they were definitely interconnected. Many of the artists were exhibiting at various art clubs in Paris, um, at the Salon de Tom, which is a center of uh, modernist expression. Um, they were getting recognition in the press and they were really getting a tremendous kind of pump in terms of, gee, this is where we're supposed to be learning, but we're, we're absorbing all this that's going on with modernism. And we're beginning to figure out our own place within this. And that's where we say that that tends to happen with many of them when they get to these art colonies a little bit later. And here we are at the art colonies. And uh, to the upper left is a work by Ethel Mars, uh, from Cincinnati to major shows there. She is one of the key figures in Paris before World War I. She's being constantly reviewed in the press. She's a bit notorious, kind of a, a wild uh, bohemian in a way, she and her partner. Um, so they find that somewhat amusing and fascinating, what she's dressing and the kind of makeup she's wearing, crazy colors and orange hair and that sort of thing. Um, but she's extremely well respected as a printmaker. She uh, ends up being on the jury of the Salon d'Automne. She and her partner il illustrate many uh, important books at the time, including Robert Louis Stevenson's uh, Garden of Verses. Uh, so she's a key figure there. She, after the, after the war, goes to Provincetown and really draws the others there. And um, Ada Gilmore was one of her friends in Paris a uh, gal from Kalamazoo, and she did that fabulous woodcut that we were thrilled to get for the show uh, that was given by the family to Kalamazoo. And then Jane Peterson was also active in the art colonies, but instead of going to Gloucester, she spends more time in Edgartown, uh, in that area, and in New York City during World War I. But you see in all of them this wonderful um, interest in vibrant color, strong patterning, I love the uh, design in the um, foreground of the Peterson to the right. Uh, it's, a, it's a painting in and of itself and really quite modern for a, a picture done in 1916. And then this is sort of the third chapter of what we were addressing in the show, which is uh, the group of artists that stay in Provincetown after World War I. Many of the artists uh, after that period go on either back to Paris or France or to their hometowns to teach. Um, Blades Lazell, who was from West Virginia, had some early training in Paris right before World War I, becomes fascinated with the modernists, the Cubists, and literally in the 20s, 30s, is one of the top women artists in the country, one of the most innovative, uh, very well known for her color woodcuts, which are purchased by major museums. And this is her classic picture of the Monongahela, uh, which we were thrilled to place with the museum a few years ago. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, I think, a very powerful Do you powerful want to talk picture. about the white line technique that so many people talk about? Yeah, this is uh, one of the uh, things that develops in Provincetown during World War I is that these, many of these printmakers were active there. And um, one of the printmakers, Nordfeld, got tired of cutting out all these blocks and having to ink them separately to create the woodcut. It was really a very tedious, tricky technical process. And he came up with the way of basically cutting one block so that uh, you didn't have to have put all these pieces together and the white lines that would separate the different areas that were incised in the block would become part of the composition, echoing a lot of modernist concepts of the use of white of the paper. So that's the central aspect of what goes on in P-Town, and Lazelle is one of the champions of that art form and teaches it for many years from a studio on the pier in Provincetown for several decades. Here's some more works by Alice Schilly. She um, is one of the artists, along with Lazelle, that continues the modernist tradition after World War I. She goes back to France, and there's a new energy, expressiveness, wonderful vitality in um, her later pictures. I'm particularly struck by the dynamism and the uh, animation of that uh, colorful trees, just so fresh, where she's not afraid at all of the medium. She just delights in the lushness and the uh, 
freshness of, of that. Uh, but it's also interesting to notice that while she's absorbed with color and expressive aspects of that, she's also intrigued by Cezanne, who's a huge figure at this time. And so in the work, the Pyrenees series up here, it's a lot of the structural quality that one thinks of, the use of the planes that one thinks of, one th thinks of Cezanne. And uh, there's something about Shelley, though, that even though it's a formal exercise in many ways, and you see these repeated forms in the windows and the doors that animate the composition, her works are always alive. So you just sense like those, those um, buildings are, are almost animated. It's fascinating. Uh, certainly uh, something that she's distinctive for. Okay, we all know that when the Americans, um, you know, we think of Man Ray, Demuth, who you know, all these different artists who go to Paris, they essentially meet, whether they meet sometimes in person, but often just in terms of looking at their works, they, they meet European modernism basic, often through Gertrude Stein, essentially. I always say American modernism would have never happened without Gertrude Stein, because the Americans would be wandering around the cafes too terrified to talk to Picasso. So, and <laughs> also good. too That's unable good. to because none of them spoke French. <laughs> and point. Picasso didn't speak French. So, but Gertrude was sort of this center that really brought, that introduced these artists, and she felt sorry for them, you know, so she kind of helped them out. Well, she did that for many of these women artists as well. And so, one of the things that I find interesting that I'd like Jim and I to maybe talk a little bit more about is, um, and in fact, didn't Ida Gilmore and some of them? They met Picasso, oh, they met they, Matisse at, at Gertrude Stein. A number of them did. I yeah. know Alice Shilley met um, Picasso there, and um, well, Ethel Mars and Maud Squire were habitués of the, of the salon. They were there all the time, and one of um, Gertrude Stein's most famous stories was um, based on those two figures, so they were definitely very much yeah, there. Yeah, she based you know. one of her stories on these, on these um, two women. So, you know, it's this center for these women artists as well, many of them working in printmaking or watercolor, making major, uh, getting major notices and reviews and um, awards, and yet, why is it that Charles Demuth is everywhere, and yet, um, uh, Blanche Lazelle until recent, more recently, or Hopkins or Shilley aren't so much. So, so, and you talked to me about that, and I just yeah. want you to sort of talk a little bit more because I find it interesting. Well, I started talking a lot about that with my daughter, uh, Tara, when she was studying art history at DePaul. I started that about seven or eight years ago. And we're trying to get to the essence of why is it that these women who were amazing, they were winning all these prizes, they were exhibiting in all these forums, they were literally competing with the top watercolorists in the country, male or female. Why aren't they held by more museums? Why aren't they in major textbooks? And we think one of the reasons, really, is that all the art galleries were controlled pretty much by men. And so even though you had these forums that were very female-friendly, like the Pennsylvania Academy and the Art Institute of Chicago with regard to their watercolor exhibitions and the Provincetown forums, the women were not getting one-person shows very often at the male-dominated galleries. So they, their work wasn't being sold to museums. Some of them were, but not as many as, as should have been. So when people went back to rewrite the history of this period, oh, well, they're lazy. You know, they go to the museum. What does the museum have? Well, let's write about those artists. Let's not go back and do the primary research and see who was really you know, on the stage at that time. So... Interestingly, there's really been kind of a, a, a bias in that regard. And it, it's fascinating because, intriguingly, many of these women were getting much more attention in the teens and 20s at the height of the suffrage movement than they were in the 40s and 50s and 60s. It's at that point that they're really being written out of the textbooks as you know, maybe trivial, sort of amateurish figures, which was not the case. Uh, so hopefully, through exhibitions like this and forums like this, people begin to understand that, you know, some of these women were really extremely skilled and very much professionals, and their work should be featured in, you know, major publications alongside Prendergast, Hassam, Luke's, Milne, that they were, that they were exhibiting with. Uh, and it's one thing, you know, I always used to get mad at my students for using 
Google searches instead of doing real research. <laughs> I still am not going <laughs> to give up on that. But it is, it is a kind of democratizing moment right now, which, which to me, when I look at the bigger picture of art history and museum collections and what I as a curator might show or might purchase, it's, it's really we're at a moment of change. And it's not just because men were curators and gallery directors and they didn't think women doing watercolors was serious. It's not, it's not yeah. gendered necessarily like that. I mean, it was that moment. But this, this change that, that when Jim and I were talking, I, I connected, yeah. you know, that you look at Shilly, but when you look at it at a bigger, you know, this bigger, broader change, and the change right now is not gendered necessarily, but what it is is this democratization of access to archives. So when yeah. someone went back in the 60s, it's really difficult to find these various reviews and archives, even though they're major publications, or <clears throat> to go back into um, exhibition files and the correspondence between um. them and whatever. Because typically what you would do, instead of just... I mean, that is like this massive, you know, horizontal range of things you're going to look at to try to think about who was doing what. What you typically do <clears throat> before, say, internet, and I get this, you would go to museums yeah. or galleries and you would say, okay, what's in, what's in that storage? You know, I'm going to rethink the, the history of this moment. But you would go to those museums and dig through there and what was there or, you know, major collections. And then, and then you sort of create your story from there. But what, what the Internet has made accessible are those things that were so hard to find, those reviews, yeah. the purchase prizes, the, um, the, the comments in, you know, a newspaper that's not a necessarily a big review but is something about you know, Matisse saying this, or this other show going on, or, you know, um, a response to saying, oh, you know, these two artists were talking together or something. Mm -hmm. And so you, we really have begun to create a much more democratic um, and much more sort of open-ended um, writing of this history that we've suddenly realized, well, okay, because of the institution, many women, and also they were working in watercolor and prints, right? But nobody took Demuth out of the picture, <laughs> um, and he was working in watercolor. But um, that we've, and no one took Marin out of the picture, right? Um, but it's, it's this access now to this material that researchers have that we just didn't have before. And it's really, we're in a moment of really kind of big change, which is sort of exciting for how we see this world. And I love this show with Jim because it, what it did was take one artist, let's say Shilly, or this, you know, what we've talked about here, it takes these, these little group of artists, and they were in Paris at the time, and they were all living, you saw it, they're all sort of living right along there at the same time, and they're talking and they're seeing things. It takes this little kernel and from that little curve, from the specific, we can make universals, right? Um, and, and that's sort of this moment, and I think that's really one of the things that Alice Shilley can contribute to a bigger picture, is, is to do that. Um, I don't know if you had anything to add. Yeah, to yeah I mean, I think that one of the more, um, things that's always been very frustrating in doing research, particularly being very tedious going back through microfiches and the old school way of trying to find these articles, which is extremely time consuming, so therefore a lot of people didn't do it, but also, if you try to, imagine trying to do that in Paris. If you're not familiar with the people and their customs, not exactly user-friendly. And that, that was very helpful with Tara because she's fluent in French, lived there for three years, and she loves to do research. So with that combination of skill with the computers and a, a link with the culture, she was able to discover all these amazing articles about these women. So then we had more courage to say what we were saying because we felt that it really was based in truth. It wasn't as if we were saying these were well-known figures and they weren't. You know, here they're all over the papers. And um, so it was, it, was, it was fascinating. And uh, hopefully, as, as Melissa was saying, that the easier it gets to maneuver these sometimes Byzantine search vehicles, uh, I almost about it go crazy trying to get in the New York Watercolor Club records the other night, <laughs> getting clicked out of it constantly. Um, you can begin to get more, uh, more information of what was going on. Um, are there any questions? You said that the, the women artists were somewhat influenced by the male artists. Was that true in reverse? Oh, I, yeah, I think the women artists were definitely, they were influenced by the male artists, but they were influenced by their peers, too, and that, I think, was 
something that we really wanted to showcase in this exhibition was to juxtapose their works at a particular time. And when you put, you know, a Jane Peterson next to an Alice Shelley next to an Ada Gilmore, it's fascinating how, how they relate to each other. So no, they were definitely being influenced by each other and by artists that they respected. Uh, Ethel Mars loved the work of Mary Cassatt and was absolutely thrilled when she gave her one of her great color prints that was so famous. Um, and she had it on display in her home her entire lifetime. So yes, no, they were influenced by the women in, in positively. Did the women influence male artists? You know, that's a very good question. I would imagine that they did, and I haven't thought of it as much from that perspective as they should. Um, <laughs> I really haven't. I'm sure that they did. I wondered if these women were really frustrated um, because they saw their peers that were male being purchased by collectors and in museums, and um, does that get reflected in their, of course, their income, but also in their correspondence? Did they leave a trove of you know, that, that's something that we're beginning to discover for that same reason that we're finding the articles and the records. It's easier now to search to try to find the archives where the letters ended up from these various artists. And we are beginning, like, we didn't have any idea that Alice Shilley traveled with as many people as she did and as socially connected she was until within the last five years and we're finding all of these letters in the computers. So... We are learning more about that, but in terms of, you know, so we'll know more about their frustration from that. I mean, happily for a number of these artists during the peak of their careers, they were getting recognition and they were doing really well, even though they weren't selling as well maybe to museums, they were silly sold extremely well in her lifetime. They would, I think, be horrified to look back and see our revisionist history of what they were doing at that time, I think, would be disappointing to some of them. Yeah, in some sense, the, the silencing of this activity and this network that was incredibly dynamic and <coughs> professional and connected happens later in the 40s yeah. and 50s, um, uh, rather than at the time, because they were winning awards and reviewers were talking about them. And, you know, I mean... Nobody snuffed at Gertrude Stein's salon, <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah. and if you're there, you're, you know, you're good. You're there. Um, so it's really kind of later when that happens a little bit. When did Shelley's art become really, uh, I think it's quite famous today, certainly in this area. Everyone loves Alice Shelley. But when did her work really become very expensive and hard to <laughs> purchase? Well, it's a t there's a two-tiered answer to that. Interestingly, it was very expensive in 1908. And in 1910, it cost the price of a car to buy an Alice Shelley watercolor in, in her heyday. I mean, they were not inexpensive. As the Depression kicks in, all of artist prices were affected tremendously. And as different styles became more prominent, particularly the rise of abstract expressionism, um, many of these people fell out of favor and their prices literally just sort of stopped where they had been. So then when we got involved with representing the Shelley estate, which was in the early 80s, I mean, we would go to the house and we'd be looking at price tags and there's a price of you know, $200 on this fabulous Shelley watercolor, which was a huge price in 1910. And that's about where we started. And I was looking at some of these watercolors and going, oh my goodness, these are so much better than what's at this gallery in New York for $20,000. Let's do some more homework. You know, is her history really substantial? And when we began to discover how amazingly substantial it was, we said, well, then at least her pictures should be selling on a par with her peers. And so we, we gradually worked to build the price structure which built through the 80s and 90s and you know, today. But still, if you compare a stunning Shelley watercolor, an amazing Peterson gouache, or a gorgeous Provincetown print by Ada Gilmore, they're at about a fifth to a tenth of what some of their peers that were winning the same prizes were that were meant. So it's not completely changed. Um, and as expensive as they are, 
they're not as bad as they could be in some ways. <laughs> Were the when the museums and um, collectors purchased, they would many times purchase through an agent who would have a, a, an open house or mm -hmm. uh, an exhibit, not in necessarily a gallery setting, but have the artist come into a home and the you know the buyers would come there. Were the women inhibited, were their sales inhibited by the fact, both in Europe and in America, that they were women and maybe doors were not as open to them because they were uh, perhaps unescorted or were single or were considered too um, forward? Not as you know, I mean, not as appreciated as the men because the men automatically had the doors open for them? That's very possible. I mean, I mean fortunately, before World War I, or certainly before, say, even 1920, you did have these annual exhibitions at the Pennsylvania Academy, the Art Institute of Chicago, the New York Watercolor Club, where there was a forum for women to sell their works. And they often sold through these shows. What happens is these vehicles become less popular, and the sales vehicle, the prominent sales medium becomes dealers, not group museum exhibitions, that's when things start changing around. And uh, many of the women just are not given access to those powerful vehicles to sell to major institutions. And I think that does, um, I think it does hurt them. Um, you know, and socially too, it was awkward. I mean, some, there were people literally who thought that if you got married, you weren't allowed to paint on your own. That's why a lot of these women never got married. I mean, Alice Shilley was, was uh, basically the very wealthy guy in Philadelphia that she knew, um, asked her to marry her, and she said, I, I can't pursue my career if I'm married. Um, Jane Peterson did marry until late in life. Um, it was a situation that was quite common, and it's hard for us to even fathom today. I mean, literally, Jane Peterson doing these fabulous gouaches getting all this recognition, she gets married. Her husband prevent, prohibits her from traveling in the 1920s. You know, it's like, wow. So, yeah, pretty, pretty amazing. I wish we knew more but to answer your question about the nuances of that, and, and hopefully we'll uh, find out more about it. Um, Do you know if uh, there was a a group of other artists who might have followed her from location to location, painting? There were definitely artists that were influenced by her uh, that, that went to the Columbus uh, Art School. Mm -hmm. um, and then there were certainly groups of artists that uh, she was associated with. I mean, she was close with Martha Walter. She was very close with Olive Rush, who became a key figure in the uh, in Santa Fe, um, she knew some of the Provincetown painters like George Elmer Brown that she um, you know, was familiar with. Uh, she was also very close to Sam and Vera White. Sam was the guy that had proposed to her, and they ended up being the most, some of the most prominent collectors of modernism in Philadelphia. And they purchased, um, oh gosh, at least 15 works by Alice Shilley and were a central part of her social structure. I think it's one of the reasons why she always exhibited the Pennsylvania Academy first, her first works that would come off the press, so to speak, from Europe, were always shown there first in, uh, in the fall um, for, gee, about 30 years. Howell bought those shilly paintings through Daniel's gallery. So it wasn't like he was at home and saw Alice and bought them, right? I mean, he bought them from the same gallery owner that he bought the Marins. Man Ray, that he bought all of his, all of his works from, Demas, you name it. I don't, I'm trying to think if there are other women artists that he bought through Daniels that are in the Howell collection, and there, I don't. There are very few. I think there uh, are. I mean, he buys William Zorak, but he doesn't buy Marguerite Zorak. Right. He turned down um, George O'Keefe, mm -hmm. much to the annoyance of Stieglitz. Uh, I think he turned her down because of Stieglitz. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't He's, like Stieglitz. He didn't like his style. But anyway, uh, yeah, that's a good question. There are not too many yeah, women in the so. in the Howell collection. And Ferdinand Howell ended up living next to for a while, 
the Alice Shilley family when they moved to Bryden Road because when Alice Shilley's sister was married, it was a real good friend of my grandmother's, they used the Howell Lawn <laughs> next door for the party for the wedding. So you know, we've speculated you know, how they got to know each other and we begin to figure out that they you know, were, were close by. And um, we found some interesting letters too that Alice Shilley wrote when Howell gave his collection to the museum and she was absolutely ecstatic about it, loved it. And wrote some beautiful letters um, praising him for his generosity and his vision and how much it meant, um, meant to Columbus. So that is an interesting uh, dialogue there that should be researched more. It should be, actually. And, you know, I had, this is just going through my head now. We know when Howell gave his collection and before that, you know, Columbus saw the um, Schumacher collection as the big collection in Columbus, you know, the old master collection. And thankfully, they, we did because that's where our bellows came from. <laughs> our early bellows, a number of really great bellows came through Schumacher and not Howell. Um, but so as the American curator, I'm happy about that. <laughs> but Howell's collection, I mean, they sort of thought, oh, Howell, he's got this sort of weird contemporary thing he does. I mean, it really... You know, people didn't embrace it, really, at all. They, they were much more interested in the more traditional stuff, not the contemporary stuff, um, certainly not contemporary modernism. And in fact, um, it was Hecking, who was the first director of the museum, who had been trained and was from the East. And when he heard about the artists that were in Howell's collection just sort of floating around, he knew what was there, right? And when he went out, you know, the story he goes out to visit Howell and he knocks on the door and Howell opens it and he doesn't want to let him in. Hecking sees behind him Demoth and Marins and, and he's, <laughs> so he starts speaking German to him and he tells him that they're in the same fraternity, right? And then Howell opens up to him, but he does because he sees, but literally, I mean, it's this wonderful reminiscence. He sees behind him like, <laughs> you know, the things that he wants that no one else is particularly interested in. So it's interesting, it's a digression to say it's really interesting to me that Alice Shilley would have been one of the very, very few people locally who would have known what Hald was doing it, and what he was collecting and the importance of it at the time. And I've often speculated on whether she ever talked to him about his collection as he was building it. Hmm. Because the sensibility that runs through the Howell collection is, hers. is so central <laughs> to hers. Well, there's, your, there's you a start about women about it, influencing you know? them. And interestingly, we just found this book. Shilly did these illustrated uh, books of Noah's Ark in the mid-20s um, that she gave out at Christmas time to kids. They're wonderful color, uh, or wonderful color line of cuts with verses underneath them. We just found one inscribed from Alice Shilly to the Heckings, 1925. So it's another part of that mm -hmm. puzzle. You, you just can't help but wonder. I mean, Columbus, in that day, how many people could Al Shilly have had to talk to about modernism and collecting? She's going to the museum every day, to the art school every day. I mean, it just seems to... And her family were essentially uh, German-Americans. They were from Alsace-Lorraine. She went back and forth between France and Germany, but, I mean, her... Her father spoke German, um, and they were, you know, raised in that uh, German American culture in the United States, in Columbus, which so. is very Howell too. Yeah. They spoke German at home yeah. as well. So yeah. you, you sort of yeah. wonder. And the fact that Hecking spoke German is what opened the door, because Howell was not really interested in talking to him at that point. I think he had a sister who was ill, or, so, or so, there was something going on, and he. And, but it was the German, and then he threw out the fact that they were in the fraternity, but he did that because he saw those really great works in the entryway behind Howell. <laughs> um, but it is interesting. I mean, so we're, Jim and I have just, I was fascinated with digging up archives and access to those kinds of things sort of more broadly nationally and internationally, but, <clears throat> you know, so now what? I'm suddenly, I've learned a lot today. I know now that Shilly and Howell and Hecking probably, you know, had this little moment when it was really just them who understood this broader picture of modernism and, and this kind of modernism yeah. that Daniels and, and um, Howell and Shilly were sort of, you know, very, very much um, conversant with and facile with. Following up on your question, on your statement about the $200 Shilly's in the, um, in the, eight, in the eight, 1980s, um, I, I remember seeing her works in the back hallways of Columbus Country Club, just hanging in 
remote yeah. hall areas. Is there a possible treasure trove of her work here locally that... I think you guys found it. <laughs> We've certainly been working hard to find it over the years, and we have found things, but um, they're, they're much fewer that, you know, that we discover something that you know, is just totally out of the blue. But we are, um, with the Internet, um, we're finding lost images that is really exciting. Where you know we're going, oh, we know this painting from the 1912 article. It's incredible. Where is it? You know, and it'll pop up in Arizona or Florida or someplace like that. Mm -hmm. So that we have discovered um, a number of interesting pictures uh, through that. But um, yeah, I mean, there probably are some that that aren't. And actually, no. one of the ways that these works are starting to show up. Like Jim says, you know, it might pop up in Arizona or something. Well, one of the ways that that's happening is museums, slowly because of funding, not because of reluctance to do this, <clears throat> are putting our collections online and they're searchable online and we're putting everything online, not just the top 200. And that means, you know, I, I don't know, you know, they let's just make Columbus a hypothetical. Museum. If there's some little museum in Arizona or some museum in Arizona that someone who had bought a shilly when they were in Paris and, and then it went through their family and then their family just gave whatever artwork was in the family to the museum and the museum took it, didn't know who Alice Shilly was because they were in Arizona and there's no connection. Um, now suddenly that's available mm. online and you go, oh, actually I was working on a Doris Lee exhibition and I found one of her paintings that I thought I would never find because and from the time I first looked for it and couldn't find it and I looked online and I looked through archives and searches and Provo and I did all my art history and then two months later three months later I thought oh I was looking for something else I was just actually I went online because I just wanted an image of it and I knew I could find that online and suddenly I found this whole thing and in those two months the University of Arizona's gallery put their collection online because I was like, how did I miss this? <laughs> First line. Well, they're slowly doing that. And so that's actually how these things, you know, get found. And also, as museums and galleries start to make more of these, I mean, bellows has been a long thing for a long time, but, you know, I still have people with bellows come up to me who have bellows that I, as a matter of fact, there's one right now that we are working with the gentleman who runs the catalog raisonne to, to um, have it, affirmed or whatever, the, and, and indeed it is a bellows, I have no doubt. Hmm. But these things still come out of this community. So, um, you know, look in your attics. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the children's book that was uh, done of Noah's Ark, and I had talked to um, some ladies who are no longer with us about being part of a, or their mothers being part of a group that painted with Alice mm -hmm. Shelley locally and did children's books. Are you aware of these, and yes. do you know who these people are? Yes, he knows. Okay. Basically, they were what they called the Half Souls group, and um, there were a number of, most of them fairly prominent, well-to-do women that would get together on a regular basis and um, work on you know, arts, crafts, printmaking, and we haven't quite gotten to the bottom of this, but we're pretty sure that the, the book that Alice Shilley gave to the children could very well have been a composite work by various artists. So I remember sitting down with this one lady in her mid 80s, just 20 years ago, going through, well, you know, Flora did that and Sony did that and somebody did, Linda did that, and, you know, trying to write this stuff down as fast as I could. Um, but there were, I, th yeah, I mean, there was definitely activity that way, and it would be interesting to know more about it. I know that the uh, Bradford family were involved, the Hanks family, the McGookins that had the Merrimore, um, a number of you know well-known names at that at that time. Uh, two questions: uh, Since that Shilly book came out a number of years ago, has that increased her popularity? And secondly, have you run across many fakes? With yeah. Well, we've definitely run across many fakes, and so unfortunately that's a problem. Um, certainly as soon as her works begin to appreciate and value, uh, then you begin to have that, that issue, and it's, it's so amusing. I mean, sometimes when people bring them to you, and you're just going, Did, what are you thinking? You know, it's like, look at this and look at that. I know which one I want. I don't want that one. You know? But it's, it's amazing, yeah. And um, it... It happens all the time. 
Um, but she certainly, I mean, the book was very helpful. And um, Bill Gertz, who wrote the book, has always been a huge fan of Shelley. And um, ever since we introduced her to her hymn to her work about 30 years ago when he first wrote a forward for a show that we did with a gallery in New York City, he's definitely been a, a big champion of Shelley. And, um, and he was one of the first to say in a key essay for Coker Gallery in New York, why is it that this woman watercolorist who was one of the best watercolorists in the country in the first quarter of the century is not in watercolor survey books? So he definitely believed that. Um, unfortunately, the attribution issue is an ongoing problem and we always tell people anytime if you have any question about whether something's authentic, please ask us, we will not Try to find out where it is, do weird things behind your back, but we'll help you so that you don't buy something that's inauthentic. We help many people after the fact, and that's never very pleasant, um, but we do. If it's do. helpful, I go to Jim. <laughs> you know, because it's just terrible to have some that happen to somebody. And what's the book that he wrote? Oh, uh, Bill, uh, it's Gertz, G-E-R-D-T-S, and he wrote, um, the major monograph on Alice Shilley, uh, but he's written several essays addressing her work as well. But he's, he's one of the top scholars in American Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, and also has written several books on um, women artists and many different topics. The best publication at this point uh, focuses on the woodcut, the color woodcut print, the Provincetown printmakers, and that's called Blanche Lazelle and I think it's the Provincetown Woodcut, something like that. It was published by the MFA in Boston, and it's an excellent uh, survey book on the women artists that were key innovators in, in P-Town. This is called Blanche Lazelle? It's called Blanche Lazelle and the Color Woodcut, something like that. If you have any problems um, finding it, just let us know at Kenny Galleries, and we'll, we'll help you with it. But I, if you go to the... Uh, Boston Museum's website, it should be on there. Uh, and Edna Hopkins' work was featured very prominently in that, in that show. You know, all cities have their personalities, right? And Columbus was, it has been slow to embrace its art history. It's, that's, just, that's just it. And I have to say, you know, I, I'm, I'll, I'll put myself in that because until <coughs> I, so, I spent about five years doing a, um, what I want to say, a um, analysis of our collection, of our American collection, and, and it really did take me about five years. I, there were many artists in our collection from Columbus. Number one, I didn't even, I'd never seen the work. I mean, you know, we have, I don't know, 6,000 American art objects, so give me a little break there. But, um, <laughs> But I had never seen it, and I didn't even really know many of them were from Columbus, and there's nothing that gives a trajectory of, of the art world in Columbus. I mean, there just isn't. Mm. It's not like Cincinnati, which yeah. has had numerous publications, and they know their art history. It's not like Cleveland that does as well. No. It's, so there are certain, you know, we just, we just never claimed it. We never created a narrative. Many of those collectors didn't collect local artists. I mean, they want... And on the other hand, yes, because not so much what they were collecting, because many of those industrialists supported those top five or six artists and would send them to Europe or mm. would support their artwork or would pay for their art education. Um, so that is really more, I think, where maybe the, the difference happens. But, um, you know, back to the Columbus, I think, number one, why Shilly and some of the, and, and Edna Boyce Hopkins didn't come out, because we've really just started doing that. And, and I myself, I pulled out all of the works in our collection that I could identify at any given time as being a Columbus artist, and then um, decided, you know, we had works by pretty much every Columbus artist, you know, they just weren't very good ones. They weren't ones that I could show with the yeah. rest of the, I mean, the Howell collection is really tough to live up to. Um, and so I have been very conscientious for the last five years, and Jim actually, the Kenny Galleries has helped us with this and other galleries in town, of upgrading our Columbus collection and identifying it. And, that, and part of that came out of the um, 
is it a sesquicentennial or bicentennial? Bicentennial of the city. Is that right? Bicentennial. Yeah, bicentennial. So bicentennial. I did the show here on Columbus Artists, and I did a show at Rife Gallery and started really looking at, at works in, you know, locally that we could upgrade, um, you know, that we could, we've bought several Edna Boyce Hopkins in the past 10 years. We've, um, mm. We upgraded um, Yativ Smith. Maybe you don't even know of that artist, but she's a wonderful artist. We've upgraded, um, who else? We bought a Ralph Fanning. We had well, no Ralph Fanning. Great Butler. A great Butler, Theodore Butler. We, we deaccessioned three so-so butlers in so-so shape and bought a fabulous one that I, it's, well, until we put up our folk art show, it was up. So, so part of that has been Columbus sort of embracing and getting you know, as a matter of fact, I did the Rife show and I included, um, you know, there aren't a lot of 19th century Columbus artists, but I included Witt and, um, who's the family? I can't think of the name. They had the 20 kids. Oh boy. Uh, Three of them were artists. Yikes. Um, oh, Frankenstein? I don't know. No. no anyway, uh, it'll come to me as we're talking. Um, but their family owned a dime museum downtown and they were cabinet makers and so it was really sort of the first museum art gallery in town and a number three of the three of the Gosh, brothers I, I know why can't i think of their name like not, not hag not hayden not uh, uh, portraitists uh, portraitists uh, one became a sculptor um, the picnic at the ohio historical society is by one of these brothers david oh, oh my god you're driving me david crazy oh. now Walcott, yeah. Walcott. Okay, okay, yeah. David Walcott. So, <laughs> so I, you know, we had this show. Well, a veterinarian in Cincinnati had bought a painting, unknown painting, unknown painter from an auction for his wife for her birthday. And they decided to have it cleaned and then they found the name. So he looked it up and found out that he's a Columbus artist. And he said, you know, now I realize he's a little more important. And I, you know, we really were just, and so he, gifted it to us. There's, he has no connection to the museum other than we finally started claiming Columbus artists, you know, mm. uh, embracing them. And so that came to the museum as a gift, which was fabulous. It's this great, I had it up on the walls for a long time. Um, so, so one of them is that we haven't embraced them until really, you know, more recently. But I think also, um, so one of them is embracing it and identifying it. And the other is, um, it, is is that they are these they are women artists yeah. and that is you know that's a 60s 70s thing and the example mm. I was going to give is is Claude Hurst you guys might remember maybe 15 years ago we did a show on a trompe l'oeil painter a female artist who showed under the name well her name was Claudine Claude Claude Hurst but she worked in oil and watercolor I think her spectacular things are in watercolor Amazing. but when the big catalog the big trompe l'oeil American trompe l'oeil came out the book, you know, 400 pages or whatever, she's not even mentioned in it. Yeah, just crazy. And yet she showed with it. So it's really getting over for women artists and for, I would say, geographically challenged artists, yes. right? Alice Shelley came back yeah. to Ohio. Clyde the, Singer came back to Ohio. Okay? Yeah. They don't get in that narrative, in the in, not the narrative of the 20s and 30s people writing, but the narrative of the art historians it's a, it's from the, the 70s the and 80s. the bi-coastal thing. Yeah. So that's just getting changed, and I would say it's getting changed if we get impatient. It's because, you know, the first dissertation in American art history wasn't until 1971. So we're young, right, in terms of the bigger picture of art history. That's so, amazing. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. They were all, wow. there were art historians, there, there were American art curators, but they basically had degrees in some other kind of art history or in American studies, in American history. Well, I thank you for coming to one of another Wednesdays at 2, and I hope to see you again.